relinquish that even. So I'm going to uh, give an overview of some work we've been doing the last few years, not just in Tucson, where, where Michael and I have been anch anchored at University of Arizona off and on, and we're kind of partners in crime and some new developing projects, but also some work that I'm going to inaugurate out in Ajo this next week of a new uh, food and fragrance garden out there. And another one that's helping the Syrian Indian communities about uh, 180 miles south of the border who during COVID were cut off from water, food, and energy by uh, storms and by government agencies who cut all the electric lines into their community. So we're getting them off the grid solar panels that they grow food under, doing a sort of food forest around the village as a buffer against other storms and a lot of work with water. And so partly at my age, it's not any new idea of mine, but what a team comes up with to be in service to communities because there's a lot of communities on both sides of the borderline that are really facing the brunt of water scarcity, high heat waves, and food insecurity. And I'm grateful that uh, several of those communities invited me to be part of the technical team that helps them forge solutions that they identify. I, I want to say that to, to get how we grow food in the desert right, we have to shed some concepts that the Western world is imposed on the uh, North American deserts. Uh, that the very word desert means in Greek and Roman and even in Hebrew sort of this place that's desolate, deserted, uh, uh, lacking in abundance. And I, I always was inspired by by Paulo's choice of this site, of all the places that he could have built uh, his largest experiment in human well-being and living, that he chose a, a, a place on the edge of the Sonoran Desert, the, you know, the uh, northernmost saguaros other than some in the Grand Canyon are just down the road by uh, the rest area south of here. So he's really on the de edge of the desert and there's Mediterranean sensibilities, and obviously from his background, just like as an Arab American, there's Mediterranean sensibilities, some of the things I do, but I think he really listened to this place as this emerged here. And so I've always been grateful for that, that um, if we shed that narrow view that a desert is a place that's something that is lacking something, not just water, but abundance and diversity, and flip that, as I think Hopi farmers have done over centuries or millennia, that, that this is a great place to live if we care for it. If we don't care for it properly, it degrades. But the desert itself is not a place that lacks integrity, diversity, or possibility. Fortunately, and unfortunately, I don't know how to spell fortunately, um, there's another sense uh, of a desert that if we nurture it, it will nourish us. And I think um, from way back in the history of this place with the gardens and greenhouses, there was a sense of that, that, that you can harvest water off these slopes, you can use the flows in arroyos, you can use the moisture holding capacity of the soils here to do something very positive and it's been done here. Um, and in the old world, we call that an oasis. That term has some baggage and trappings because uh, there's, we think of it as this little nucleated place, but there can be riverine oases like the ones in Morocco that are all done on rain-fed agriculture just like they, they are at Hopi. And again, where my family's from in Lebanon, in a place that looks much like this place. Um, it's not hundreds, but thousands of years of um, not remaking the environment to fit the crops, but adapting the crops to fit the conditions of, of that environment. 
so des as I said, desert oases not, not be nucleated islands that just support a few families, but they can be whole corridors down uh, 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 water channels from springs all the way out. But to keep that going, we have to protect the source of that water, the artesian springs that naturally flow out of the ground. In the Verde Valley, just north of us over the last 20 years, we've lost 80% of those freshwater springs due to groundwater pumping in the valley. So that's, in a way, similar to what uh, Michael was talking about, that with uh, the pumping of, of the Black Mesa mine, a lot of the springs just coming out of the rocks just to the north of the Hopi villages dried up. And to see some of those places, when I worked up there as a teacher, that were reservoirs that the community used year-round historically looked like an empty swimming pool was one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever seen. But again, deserts are not intrinsically barren. Uh, this picture from a, this is a farm. Uh, this, is, this is taking the plants in the surrounding desert, transplanting them or seeding them into a, a desert polyculture, we call it, a desert agroforestry system that uses the, the local edible plant species and brings them into agricultural production. None of those things are domesticated in the sense that they've been highly bred because for fear of breeding out their adaptations to that place. But it's juxtaposing different life forms, not just trees, but cacti, uh, understory plants, uh, like oreganos and wild chilies and things to create multiple harvests over a year's time that, that farmers can move from one to another crop sequentially over the warm season, begin to do their propagation in the winter and then start in again. And um, remarkably on um, two to four acres, about 1,500 farmers in this little Mexican village um, make a living that's twice the average income of people in the state that they live in. So it's not um, something that's just for subsistence farmers as if that's a bad thing. <laughs> but, but these people also have ki cash crops uh, where they take the different kinds of cactus fruit from organ pipe fruit to dragon fruit, make value added products for that. And on top of those economic benefits, they also have some of the highest breeding populations of um, endangered bats that move between the US and Mexico. And those bats, because they're present there, produce fruit that uh, have higher nutritional content and are larger, so they actually get better prices than their fruit than people who aren't taking care of the bats. And so when, when we hear that ter term that I just love about all our relations, they're farming with all their relations. They're not farming with a human presence as the only uh, active agency in, in that place. S given all of that background, let's take a peek, and I think I'm misspelled peak too. This is just this is my day for spelling. I think the wind is moving around the letters on the PowerPoint thing. Of what we're up against at this moment in time. And this is a happy news, not like we need any more bad news. Yeah, there's a peak. There's a peak, yeah. That's right. So it's it's so funny that we call these things temperature anomalies, because if you look at that trend, yes, it's up and down. But that's the way the world's going, that Oregon and Washington got temperatures of 116 to 120 this last summer. Um, I wish that will be an anomaly that they never face again. The, the Yukon Territory got over 105. This is not good news. <laughs> and, and yet, we, we sort of have, I don't know, want to want to say that uh, that we're uh, 
we're in denial about it. It's almost like we've been comatose to realize that this is going to change where our food comes from and what we eat, what we eat and how our fields look like in the future are simply not going to be like the conventional agriculture that we see between Phoenix and Tucson. They, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but um, business as usual in much of Arizona and California's agricultural valleys is going to have to change radically. And I was just down in Pinell County that's going to be ground zero for a lot of the hardest, most painful challenges right away. And farmers s said to me, I wish we would have started on these shifts 10 years ago because now it may be too late. I mean, we have to build new infrastructure and we haven't put that money aside and some of us are already in debt. So I, I have a lot of empathy for the farmers that are going through this. It's not like they're our enemies because they use more water in the past than they can use now, but they know that the writing's on the wall. Um, there's tangible damage from extreme temperatures and I want to say this is humbling as someone who calls himself an agricultural ecologist. I planted 140 kinds of fruit trees from the Mediterranean and in the deserts of the Southwest and Asia. Um, again, family, family trails out uh, as far south as Yemen and then east into Persia. And so I had exchanges to get some of the fruits my grandparents grew and all of that. And last year, even though we had 25 inches of rain that began in m late July, in June, when the fruit were flowering, fruit trees were flowering, it was so horrifically hot, even at this elevation, 116 to 120, that our trees flowered, but then the flowers aborted, and we had maybe a dozen fruit per, per fruit tree. We've never seen anything as dismal of that. So even someone who is selecting fruit to be desert adapted, these, these, these perennial plants aren't invincible. They're, they sometimes fail because the frequency of these stresses and the potency of them is so strong. But it's not just something about uh, heat waves causing the abortion of fruits during uh, uh, the time when trees are flowering fruiting. It's water scarcity because there's higher evaporation from the soil and, higher, and from reservoirs and higher transpiration from the plants themselves. But we have fields going barren for longer. Weeds don't even come up and more dust blows out of them. And so we have aggravated soil erosion. We have vegetation loss like the things on the boundaries of fields. I had a project 10 years ago putting hedgerows and fence rows in on 12, 15 farms in southern Arizona, and half of those died over the last two years of drought. Um, and then wildfire damage, because we then had that 25 inches of rain in southern Arizona, probably we're going to have the worst fo fire season in history, and even if you're not next to the fire, that's going to affect the watersheds, and that's going to affect the, the air, of course, with the smoke and everything. But it's, it's going to have basin-wide effects. And we slipped into water rationing in the Colorado River, not because of drought so much in, in Arizona where the big farmland is, but the droughts in the headwaters. Uh, Navajo and Apache County, all the way up into Colorado and Wyoming, so that the farmers in southern Arizona who can no longer get Colorado River water can't even apply for drought relief payments because the drought wasn't where their farm was. So there's all kinds of um, dissonant effects that throwing farmers' lifestyles into more and more uncertainty. And I think we have to live and build and design places for that uncertainty. I'm, I'm not going to say this because I'm here at, at uh, Arcosani alone, but what 
Paulo did for me was to give us design principles that can not only be used for buildings, but for communities and for agriculture too. In other words, his design principles were sound. You can, you can now say, well, maybe there's too much concrete and embedded energy in concrete, but that, that was not something we understood at the time this was being built. But his design principles were so sound that I think we need, need to metaphorically say, okay, what can we do from learning from how this place is structured to apply to agriculture? And I, I, I really believe that. That's not a gratuitous thanks to Paulo. That's, that's a real deal that he broke through in making us think about design in arid lands in a different way. So that dark colored blotch on the four corner states is that we're in ground zero for how climate change is gonna affect air, uh, not just uh, our four state era, but the 12 state arid west and semi-arid west. And what we used to call the semi-arid west is gonna become the arid west. And when I got back and saw dried up cornfields in Iowa and Missouri last summer, I'm thinking, oh, it's not just us in, in the southwest that are facing drought and heat waves. This is, this is two thirds of the US. And so that little purple spot, if you follow something like Drought Monitor, which is kind of like uh, once a week beating your fingers with a hammer <laughs> because the, the news is so dismal, that purple spot keeps on growing. <laughs> and, and it's not gonna go away. And so we have to you know, face the music that business as usual isn't gonna happen, but all of you have to be co-designers in a new kind of way of producing food. And by new, I don't mean to deny the 4,000 years of, of knowledge and success and the sweat equity that Hopi farmers and other farmers here in the Southwest have. I'm not asking us to wipe that slate clean. I, I do say that we have to be careful in culturally appropriating things from that and we need to look at what's right in front of us. So nature is a model, good cultural solutions are a model, but we really have to be careful about the cultural appropriation parts of that. Just can't borrow Hopi corn and put it on 10,000 acres in Pinell County and, and think that, that uh, that's some silver bullet because it's a cultural context that made that corn work, not just a cultural or the genetics of that corn. It's both, not one or the other. So this is that uncertainty again. If we, if we think it's just gonna be a world that's hotter and drier, we're missing the point. The, the coefficient of variation, I guess is what the st statisticians call it, is like increasing like this when it used to be like this. So those ups and downs are really uh, what drives farmers and ranchers nuts. One farmer said to me, if, if you can figure out a way that I have more stability from year to year in the grass on my range out there, so that I don't have to sell off my whole herd or flock every five years and then take four more years to build it back, I'll do anything you tell me. I'll, I'll become a carbon sequestration farmer for the carbon market if that can stabilize my yields. I don't even want, need that carbon market. I just need to be in a place where I don't have to sell off my herd every five years. So dealing with that uncertainty is half the dance that we have to learn. The, the sad part of it is that agriculture has been part of the problem that's brought climate change on. And again, that's not to disparage any farmer or farming community. But uh, that red at the bottom is agriculture and our food system overall, their contribution to greenhouse gases, um, uh, uh, land use changes, loss of fresh water, eutrophication or pollution of our waters, um, and uh, the loss of biodiversity. 
And so because we haven't gotten agriculture right to fit each kind of landscape in North America, we, we've been thinking it's one size fit all, fits all, that if you get seeds from Monsanto or, or burpees even, that you can plant the same damn seed from South Carolina to, to Washington or Oregon, that just doesn't work anymore if it ever worked. And so agriculture has been part of the problem, even though I think most farmers are smarter than that. They just got duped into an easy answer because they're being bombarded six hours a day on radio and TV with silver bullet solutions that don't last very long. This is the toughest part for me. Uh, when I first moved to Arizona, nearly every farm and ranch had undocumented farm workers from Mexico in it. But they came back year and year because their families were just in Sonora or Chihuahua and they could go back across the border and then the ranchers would pick them up at the fence, knowing that they crawled under the fence, pick them up and bring them back to the farm or ranch. The only book sold in my county where I live now was a thing called Ranch Spanish of how farmers could learn to talk to their farm workers because every farm had undocumented workers on it. Now those people can't get across. They're, they were skilled in knowing how to deal with the desert because they grew up in places where there weren't buffers from the drought and heat. Now in our farm worker workforce, we have refugees from 44 countries in Arizona. This is the biggest social justice issue for me in Arizona. We have never had an African American, Asian American, Native American, or Hispanic American on the Arizona Agricultural Commission in 110 years of statehood. What's wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture now that the Dominant demographic for farmers in Arizona is women farmers from the Navajo Reservation. We have more women farmers than men farmers in this state according to the latest statistics. How many of you knew that? Yeah. And that took five years after the stuff came out. Yeah, yeah. There's been two families in the Farm Bureau Board that are from Chemoeve Reservation, but none on the Arizona Ag Commission. And that's, by my standards, illegal. Mississippi does better than that with minority farmers. Mississippi does better than Arizona. And why that's important is because there's a rising death toll among farm workers in Arizona. After COVID, the most frequent visitors to urgent care and emergency rooms in the summer are farm workers with heat exhaustion, heat stroke, dehydration, muscle wasting, goes by the big word ramdiliosis, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it, and 10 other things, pesticide exposure, dust exposure. Etc. So the people who bring us our daily bread, if you want to use that uh, Hebraic and, and Christian metaphor, are the people most likely to need to use food banks and soup kitchens in Arizona. What I'm saying is that the people who harvest our food in this state can't afford to buy the food that they harvest. So Ironically, the federal government did a study of all cabinet agencies, you know, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Human Health, and the greatest residual structural racism in the federal government is in the USDA. That, that for reasons that are historic, not, I'm not saying anyone in you know, pointing the finger to the Secretary of Ag or anyone else. For historic reasons, there's less services to minority farmers than ever before. And th thank our creator that Kamala Harris and is talking Secretary of Ag Vilsack and uh, prioritizing funds for minority farmers, including black women farmers, Navajo women farmers, 
etc. for the first time in American history. Um, half of those things, the number of deaths, are related to outdoor working, whether it's landscaping in Phoenix during the middle of the summer or, or agriculture. So I'm not going to go through the whole li uh, list, but um, we're just seeing more and more things related to heat and drought bumping up on that list. And um, as I suggested that if you're not making a good living off working in agriculture and a lot of it's contract teams where you may only be able to work five months a year and that's your employment for the whole year, the probability that you're among the food insecure even though you're a farm worker is really high. So what will it look like when we try to feed ourselves and try to thrive in a hotter desert world in the future, what I call the braced new world, that we're going to be simmering while, uh, even before we put our vegetables in the frying pan. And I'm actually hopeful about this, in part because there's ag scientists like Michael who understand that we can learn from the desert itself of how plants grow under gout and heat and uncertain conditions. And I, in ways I sort of fear that old agricultural trope of making the desert bloom because we got the green revolution out of it that did a lot of collateral damage. But if we actually look why the plants in the deserts bloom when they have, shift our planting cycles when we have moisture in the soil and all of that, we really have a chance of making it through. And so we're back to that oasis idea of structuring um, multiple strata of plants in the same place. And that's actually what's been done by indigenous farmers in that whole orange swath that you see on that map up to the Hopi and Havasupai and Chemaweve and, and uh, Navajo reservations in the north and all the way down uh, almost to Guadalajara in the two-fifths of Mexico that's desert lands. So there's incredible traditions of farming using rainwater rather than using pumped fossil groundwater and fossil fuel that can shine the light. But we also have the vast reservoir of desert plants like like choya cacti that I grow as a crop for its buds that are as delicious as artichoke hearts and asparagus tips. And my teacher, uh, Richard Felger, who died last year, a year and a half ago, to, before COVID hit his community, when I worked with him in the 70s, he said, if we simply fit the crop to the land rather than remaking the land to fit the crop with center pivot irrigation systems spinning 24 hours a day in systems that use as much water to make a half pound hamburger as an Olympic sized swimming pool. It will work in a way that nourishes people and the land. And so these are just some of the plants that do that. Uh, uh, saguaro cacti and their legume nurse plants. We can use the concept of biomimicry to say, how can we use the overstory shade of a nitrogen fixing and water pumping legume like a mesquite tree and grow things under it so that they're buffered from the heat extremes. Plants like agaves that use one fifth of the water over a decade to produce an amount of edible biomass equal to or greater than corn and sugar cane and then seeds like uh, amaranths. It's an annual plant, including uh, the beautiful Hopi amaranth that um, I still see in the fields around uh, Lower Moenkopi, but very few other places among Hopi fields that it needs a kickstart of water to get going, but it's what's called a C4 plant. It's incredibly water use efficient. May only grow two months, but produces a ton of seed and a ton of leaves that to my taste buds are better than spinach. I, I think I got scared of spinach when I had to eat that crappy canned spinach as a kid that Popeye ate. So can we envision a new model of food 
uh, production based on ecological adaptations and indigenous knowledges of our desert, that promotes resiliency of our lands and communities, that deals with three problems all at once. We've never designed ag systems to deal with three things all at once, that it should be good for the land, good for human health, and good for rural economies. If the communities that are on the edge of the fields are suffering, even if a farm produces great food, we're still suffering. If we have something that's high yielding and nutritious, but we import it all away from Arizona, we're still suffering. If we deal with human health, but we grow that stuff in a way that's damaging to the land, we're still suffering. So again, I think it's looking at arid adapted plants. Agaves is but one of about 27 groups or genera of plants, wild plants, not just cultivated plants that we've identified. The use of water harvesting to concentrate water in places where we want to grow food. And then this is an archaeological uh, aerial photo of uh, Snake Town, the, the great agricultural village uh, south of Phoenix, about 35 miles, that if we forget that it takes a cohesive culture with knowledge that's shared among farmers, we'll never make it. One farmer alone cannot be sustainable. You have to be, you know, it's a take a village thing. You can't save pollinators by having good practices on one farm because the bees, the butterflies, the bats, the hummingbirds, don't stay on one farm. They don't know where, where political or property boundaries are. So we really need communities of farmers, and that's why I have such respect for Hopi. It's not Michael going it alone, but a whole bunch of people who still have knowledge in their families about how to do it right. And the, the diet part to me is something that took... 15 years of my life away, I guess. I lost a Tohono O'odham friend that we worked on. A, I was kind of an extension agent or uh, ag extension agent out on the Tohono O'odham reservation after my master's degree. And I lost my best friend to diabetes uh, and he was only 32. And I just dropped everything and for the next year get, tried to get samples of foods to nutritionists, not many U.S. nutrition labs were interested in that, so I, I actually had a collaboration through National Science Foundation and CSIRO in Australia to work with labs that were already in service to Australian Aborigines to look at their food plants because they were looking at how it affected diabetes, not just how much protein in it. And so they called the foods in both those deserts slow release foods because they didn't spike blood sugar levels right after a meal but over the next six to eight hours there was a slow blood sugar curve that insulin could keep up with so they'd go in tandem where if, if you eat junk food from Cordis Junction your blood sugar goes straight up and then the insulin has to catch up with it sorry to pick on Cordis Junction but any truck stop town in Arizona same problem we have the most incredible range of slow release foods in the deserts of North America that you could have anywhere. And rather than thinking it's retro or old fashioned to go back to them, we need to figure out how to better utilize them and just not put up with people who say, oh, you're trying to make us go back to eating like cavemen. Uh, if the, this is gonna blow your mind but the cost of dealing with diabetes in Arizona right now, the medical cost to families and to their insurance companies, and I suppose to taxpayers, but I don't like to look at it that way, is greater than the farm gate income of all farmers in Arizona. When the collateral damage of a food system is greater than its benefits to a community, we have to say what's wrong with this picture. So, Diabetes isn't going to go away just like climate change isn't going to go away unless we get serious about this. So we're using this system of 
that we see in the wild of uh, nurse plants, legume trees with underlings that need buffer from temperatures to inspire the way we grow crops. We're taking the nurse plant guild that you see here that we see in the wild and say, how can we apply it to an agroforestry system? And now we're doing this in Patagonia, Ajo, the Seri villages and, and two places in Tucson. We're also then making a leap and saying, what other kind of shade structures can we use? And at Biosphere 2, we're using solar panels as nurse plants. <laughs> we cover some water off them, funnel that down in drip lines to the crops below. Uh, at the same time, produce all the energy needed on a farm from the solar panels. And ironically, having greenery around the solar panels keeps them in their optimal range for making renewable energy. Most of the solar collectors we have in Phoenix and Tucson are in urban heat islands where they get too hot to even produce the optimum energy. If I say that right, simply by putting greenery under them and around them, we're allowing them to, to, to produce at optimum capacity and the solar panels live longer because they're not degraded, not live longer like we live longer, but you know what I mean. So, so although it looks pretty techy, we're doing this in 20 acre um, uh, agrivoltaic gardens in the two Seri Indian villages over the next three years in a million peso grant that the federal government just gave to the villages. And again, we're, we're not just believing that this produces better food and more food under shade, but most of the plants we're growing need only 60% of the ambient solar radiation that they're now capturing. That's more stress from that. We just, uh, under the solar collectors, if they're just in the shade 40% of the time, higher yields, higher bricks content, soluble solid nutrition content in the food itself than if we grow them in the open sun. When I've done this at my place in Patagonia at this elevation, it's also another amazing factor that something like romaine lettuce grown under the collectors goes another five weeks after the same lettuce variety that's grown out in the open bolts and quits producing leaves. So we get a five week longer season of productive vegetables during the summer. Um, I, I always feel uncomfortable that people think I make this shit up by myself. <laughs> and, and you can see that most of what I do these days is working on multicultural teams with people who are far more talented than I am. I, I just don't mean that gratuitously, but I'm so grateful that science has shifted to be something of teamwork and that where we live in the Southwest, we can have multicultural teams rather than you know tokenism about this stuff. And so it, almost every paper I do now are sometimes with Herbalists who spent their whole life doing that. Uh, a former student of mine who's now the tribal chair in, of his tribe in Mexico. I, I can keep on going, but you get the picture. It's the most satisfying time in my life to be working on these topics because of the talent and knowledge and different perspectives that someone from another culture can offer a team like this that I can't and I'm indebted to them. You know, the other problem that we have to deal with is that the best farmland in the state is now under asphalt and roofs. Uh, Phoenix used to be a paradise, according to George Webb, a Pima farmer that died about 50 years ago. He said before we dammed up all the rivers, that was paradise. Even some of the Hopi used to live down on the northern edge of Phoenix Valley and the Agua Fria National Monument south of them has their agave fields just north of New River. So whether this is New River or Tucson, we see the best farmland now inaccessible and before most of you die, I think we'll be removing the asphalt and the concrete from some of the best farmland 
we've ever had in this state and bringing it back into cultivation. Now that doesn't, don't take that as a death threat to Phoenicians. You know, I don't have anything against people who live in Phoenix. In fact, my own Lebanese relatives call themselves Phoenicians, so I got to live with that one. Anyway, we're doing this at Tumamak Hill. We're launching that garden in July. We're launching the one in Ajo next Wednesday. And um, there are to be places where people gather and reflect on this stuff. And so this is the kind of planning mock-ups we did for the one in Ajo. We also are doing big projects to educate people on the plants that are already at their doorstep that tend to be neglected by newcomers to Tucson or Phoenix. Keep in mind that the average person in Phoenix has lived in their ho house less than four years and has either come in from another state or moved around Phoenix Valley five times before they settle on where they want to live. So I've got to remind people of things that are literally in their backyard that they've never eaten that are more nutritious than the crap they're getting from Safeway. Agaves are not just for tequila. Um, uh, I eat agave powder in my food, roast my own agaves, have a roasting pit to make food products from it every day, do agave coleslaw, do agave fermented be beverages, so you don't have to plant agaves just to get drunk on tequila. Mesquite pods, we have a $6,000 mesquite mill that we loan out to five communities in southern Ari Arizona that we take care of in our garage. We bring up the Siri fire roasted mesquite that's on the slow food arc of taste from our friends in, in um, the, the Concock or Siri villages that's south of the border so that they have another source of income. They save a lot of it back for their own use. And um, I didn't wear them today. I wore them yesterday, but I didn't feel like I had to wear boots today. But I also wear prickly pear boots uh, that the fiber in my boots it's made from prickly pear fiber, about the half the weight of regular boots. Uh, stay cooler, wick up any moisture, and you're going to see other products besides food come out of these desert plants. So Michael complained to me about two weeks ago that he has so damn many journalists asking him for interviews that he has any time to do his basic work. But that is part of his basic work. He's probably the best voice to ever talk about this stuff in our state. But there's a groundswell of attention there. We're the laboratory of the future. If we don't get it right now, if we don't take on the responsibility of getting this right here in Arizona and New Mexico, there's going to be people in 10 other states that face unbelievable challenges because we haven't moved quickly enough on it. So. If we have a chance to get it right, it's going to have a ripple effect throughout the West and save lives, not just land. So I just want to leave with that. Thank you. Sure, they have to be multi-choice questions. Yes, they do. I'm going, to, I'm going to pass the microphone to whoever has a question just so we can catch that on the recording. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, P please delete from the recording my little hit on Cordis Junction, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Yeah. Yeah, so those little things with illustrations, it's at Agave, all of that, are online with uh, Arizona Cooperative Extension. Uh, Parker Filer is a contact person there, but we had seven organizations from Mission Garden to the Food Bank to Arizona Sonor Desert Museum, the university, have this community service project to get tried and true recipes out, how to process it, because a lot of people say, Oh, I like the taste of it, Choya, but how the hell do I harvest it without getting, you know, feeling like a porcupine? 
So we, it's also about the preparation and the timing and all of that. So it's online, but we also have booklets in Spanish and English. And if you write me, um, I had my email up there earlier, but, but you, can, you can get it through Norm or, or get a card for me later. We can get you that recipe. That's only five plants, but they're the most common plants in Tucson and Phoenix on roadsides and vacant lots. Thank you for your good work on that. And uh, we need like a thousand people like you uh, engaging their communities in this stuff. So thank you. Yeah. Michael. You had mentioned, and this is kind of like some of my work too. Uh, and thanks for talking, by the way. I appreciate, you know, lear I always learn a lot from you, Gary, and I appreciate that. But I was wondering, you had said that there was no um, uh, minority representation on the Arizona Ag Commission. I didn't know that. I didn't know that also. What, so what would be the process to get that on there, except maybe yeah. you're running for U.S. Senate or something? Right? So th this is something I've been working on five years and have gone to the Ag Commission several times. And at one time, uh, the, the director, Mark Killiam, promised me that he'd have a Native American Advisory Council. And I said, well, that's n nice, but you need na Native Americans on the actual commission that sets your priorities. It's, that's what citizens' uh, commissions are about. They, they are the oversight on the agency, and you're not talking about the like a task force of Native American farmers is a great. And then he said, okay, I'll invite you to a meeting. And at one point I gave him your name and a bunch of name of other farmers, but I said, you have to decide what tribes should be represented. I can't recommend who from different tribes. These are just farmers I know, but you need to talk to tribal ag, you know, uh, uh, programs and, and cast a bigger net. And he had one meeting and none of the people there, it was on uh, the, ag, the state legislature day, had a special event for Native Americans, but there were no farmers there. So I said, good gesture, but you gotta go deeper. And then I've gone on their website five times and it lists a, a, a Native American advisory committee, no one's still yet on the commission, but it has no minutes and it didn't mention who's on it. And I asked one time and they said, well, we've had two preliminary meetings. And I said, what did that mean? Who's, who attended? Well, we don't know. So either they don't have the way to outreach, which is a problem to me because the fifth of the state is easily as Indian lands and they get the money for the whole state for ag technical assistance that then they pass on to Navajo and maybe one other tribe, but they keep all the rest as if they're in full service to them and they don't have the contact. So this is a real problem for me and it's a problem even with non-native people that are part of the farm workforce. If there's never been a farm worker on the commission means this is only for private landowners. So the reason why we didn't know that Navajo women were the largest demographic before them is that believe it or not, the census counted each reservation as one farm. One farm because it's, it's communist land, you know. <laughs> That's how they say, it. well, there's no private landowner, so it's all one thing, so how can we count it as that? And the Navajo sued them and got a settlement on that, and now everyone who does a census on the Navajo reservation has to speak Navajo and say, do you identify yourself as a farmer? And that's the test, not, uh, do you make more than $15,000 an acre and get subsidies of $20,000 and, and own your land? No, it's, it's district land or you, what you were talking about, usufruct rights. Uh, it's community land or women's land. So, so there's a lot of things we need to fix and I'm not disparaging uh, Director Mark Killiam or I even contacted the Attorney General of the state and said, you gotta have advisory communities that represent the stakeholders. That's law, that's federal law. And um, I just feel like a voice crying out in the wilderness because my own family, when they came to this country, were fruit pickers and stuff, and I knew how much my grandfather suffered because there was no safety net for those guys. So 
whether it's uh, refugees or, or native people, we've just got to do better than what we've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, can, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. It sounds almost like a food forest project. Dude. It yeah. is. It is. Uh, and and I, well, don't open up the faucet because uh, I, 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 I may flood you with information about it because we're about ready to, you know, christen it or inaugurate it Tuesday or Wednesday night. And it's all I'm thinking about these days. I barely got here without running into a telephone pole because I think about it so much. So it's about 25 different native food plant uh, species. By native, I mean part of the desert flora. There's no indigenous seed crops here because we decided to focus on perennials from the, uh, the deserts from Ajo south through the Esta thing. So they include some things in northern Mexico. Mexican oregano, wild chilies called chiltepines, mesquite, ironwood, uh, saguaros, prickly pear, choya. Um, um, I, I could keep on naming, but you get the picture. And they're done in multi-strata uh, agroforestry systems to provide the shade to the things that need the extra temperature buffering. And so it's about 180 by 120 foot garden with 40 to 50 species altogether in a little courtyard that's like a Mexican dooryard garden of showing how it's a Sonoran Mexican tradition to have the multiple strata uh, in, in gardens right out your door where you get your herbs as you're cooking. You know? So we're honoring the three nations that, that have been involved in the International Sonoran Desert Alliance. And it's, you can see it any time after Wednesday for the rest of the life of this universe. Yeah, they're long-lived plants is what I'm saying. And my, uh, ironwoods live 800 years, which is more than I'm going to live. So respect your elders. Yeah. Anything else?